Now, probably more than ever before, we are constantly being recorded. Even as I speak right now, I know my words and my movements are all going to be recorded on that camera, looked at, observed, and analyzed. We have created sticks where we can hold out and get a better view of ourselves to record what we're doing. There are videos all over the internet of people recording various different things. You have kids who stick their arms in germix and light it on fire just to see a flame. There are people who jump off ceilings and onto trampolines just to see it, just to watch. And the funniest ones are when they miss the trampoline altogether. There's a common phrase nowadays called, or it says, you need pics or it didn't happen. If you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Now think of those kids who light their arms on fire, who jump off ceilings and jump off roofs. Look, look down the road about 30 years and they look back on those videos that are still there. They're uploaded. They're never going anywhere. Do you think they would cringe just a little bit at their actions. I uh, am 24 years old and I think I can say back in the good old days um, where things were recorded on cassette or VHS where you needed about a mile and a half of wire in a VHS player to show something that your parents recorded of you on television, on the television. And so you have memories of going into the back of the closet and pulling out those baby tapes and kind of cut the tape and now it's gone forever those moments that make us cringe when we were little were erasable now you can upload things live onto facebook everything is being recorded our lives are now on full display in the same way the apostle peter is pretty similar Across four gospel accounts in the book of Acts, Peter and the life and his faith was on display for all to see. And not all of it was pretty. I wonder if old St. Pete, standing at the pearly gates waiting for people to walk on in, ever looks down at his copy of scripture and just cringes at his actions. The way one of us would in our embarrassing moments of our childhood or growing up. Peter's life is full of great triumphs that everyone saw. It's also filled with great blunders that everyone saw. Scripture shows no favoritism towards Peter. In fact, church tradition tells us that it was Peter himself who sat down with John Mark when he was recording his own gospel account. That is why the disciples come off as unknowing or incompetent in Mark's gospel. Also, Peter's call to ministry wasn't very glamorous. He was on a boat when this preacher named Jesus came walking along the shore and started yelling at him, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. The call was really only two words, follow me. It wasn't a beautiful burning bush. There wasn't a blinding light on the road to Damascus. And it wasn't a dream in the night where you could reply, Hanani, or here I am. He was on a boat, with his, and he had to share it with his brother Andrew. But what a great realization it is to know that a calling from God can come in simplicity, in just a couple of words. But for Peter, this was the beginning of his faith being on display. So what about that other story of Peter on a boat? Or maybe more specifically, what about that story of Peter walking on and maybe in the water? Here again is a prime example of faith being on full display. You know the story. The disciples are on the Sea of Galilee and the winds and the waves are knocking the boat back and forth. And the boat was too far away from land to make any real sort of dock or an attempt to dock. Then all of a sudden, to make matters worse, there's some sort of apparition walking towards them. 
And like a normal functioning human being, everyone panics more and more. That is, until a very familiar voice cries out, Take heart, it is I. Do not fear. And in true Petrine tradition, Peter calls back and says, If it's really you, command me to come out here. Or in my own personal translation, Double dog dare me to come out here, and I will. Jesus replies, Come on. And Peter exited the boat and actually walked towards Jesus. But Peter began to be consumed by the towering waves of the blustering wind. And he took, off, he took his eye off Christ and immediately began to sink. And Peter was sinking like Epitane Petrin. Or Peter was sinking like a rock. Or maybe more clearly put... Peter was sinking like Peter. But when he cries out to the Lord, Peter is saved immediately and without question. Now that Jesus steps into the boat with a cold, wet, and presumably frightened Peter, Jesus tells him that he has little faith and questions Peter why he doubts. And in that moment, though, everyone in the boat bows down and proclaims him as Christ. In Matthew's Gospel. You of little faith. Can you imagine how Peter could be feeling? He was only he was the only one who stepped out of the boat. And he's the only one that called out to Christ. What about those who stayed in the boat? Why was their faith not being put into question? Fairly or unfairly, Peter's faith was on full display once again for all to see. The triumph and the embarrassment. Nothing is spared from Scripture. It's all there. Faith being lived out is not always beautiful. Jesus calls Peter, Peter's faith little. But we shouldn't think of little faith as low in quality, but maybe small in quantity. Faith is not something that we either have or do not have. It is a force inside of us that needs attention and growth, that yearns and begs for maturation and development. Peter didn't have any faith or no faith, but his faith was still little, like a seedling beginning to take root. As long as Peter was keeping his eyes on Christ, he could walk upon the waters as easily as one of us could walk across a parking lot. But when the waves and the wind caught his attention more than the one who stands above the wind and the waves is when he began to sink. I remember the day I got my learner's permit to drive. It's pretty surprising that they actually let 15-year-olds with no driving experience come in and take a test and are allowed to drive an actual vehicle on the actual road. Now, outside of driving a few laps around my neighborhood at a blistering 20 miles an hour, I have not had a lot of driving experience at age 15. But we went to go visit my grandparents in Honeaker, Virginia. Population, a few. That livestock may uh, outnumber the actual people. But my dad thought this was a good place to really start my driving experience. So we pull off on this uh, old country road and stop at this uh, old furniture store. And he says, all right, let's go. And so I slide into the driver's, uh, the driver's seat and take the helm of a 2001 fire engine red Dodge Durango. And when he turned it on, it sounded like everything good about American-made cars. And so we pull out of the furniture store and onto the highway. Still a little scared. Haven't quite hit 30 miles an hour yet. Dad kind of frustrated and goes, son, can we hit at least 50 before we get into town? And I said, all right, let's go. Slam on the gas and I am fixed on the speedometer, trying to hit 50. But if your eyes are on the speedometer and not on the road, you, could, you can get in a little bit of trouble. 
remember this is a backcountry road that dips forward and back, left and right. And so I was trying my hardest to hit 50 miles an hour, and I didn't realize I wasn't looking at the road. I was looking at the speedometer, and my dad has to take control of the steering wheel so we don't run into the side of a cliff. He says, whoa, 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 slow down. Takes control of the steering wheel, and I slam on the brakes. He says, Tyler, you got to keep your eye on the road. Don't keep your eye off the road. In the same way, Peter found himself so focused on things that were not Jesus that he began to sink and swerve into the sea. But as soon as Peter cried out, Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and saves him. How many times has Christ called us out of the boat? And how many times have we needed to call for help? Maybe it was a job, maybe it was school, maybe a marriage. And we show great faith by stepping out. But we begin to focus on the things that are not Christ, the wind and the waves. And we, for some reason, take our eyes off the one who stands above the wind and the waves. Above the chaos, above the fear. And we ourselves begin to sink. But again, take heart. Know that in our sinking deep in sin, all we need to do is call on the name of Jesus. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jesus. This takes us to the crux of Peter's life on display for us. Found in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 24. Verse 23. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the teachers of the law, and the elders and the chief priests, and that he must be killed on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How can this be? Peter gets it right. He correctly proclaims who Christ is. He's the only one to correctly identify it. In Mark's gospel, it is Peter who uncovers this messianic secret. It is Peter who is the one that Christ calls the foundation of the church. So how, within ten verses, does Saint Peter become Satan Peter? This is faith on display for all to see at its finest. Peter understood who Jesus was, but he didn't still understand the nature of Christ's mission on earth. And how many times do we get caught up in the same conundrum? We are seminarians, after all. There's a presupposition that we know who Christ is. But how many times do we still not get what Christ does? Peter thought that Christ had come to overthrow the government, which may have been Peter's preferred motive of Christ. But Christ had more in mind. And it was Peter who helps us flesh out Christ's motive on earth. Our faith, then, is something that cannot be perfected. Rather, it is strengthened over time. Peter had enough faith to recognize Jesus as the Christ, but even this confession is not as developed as Peter originally thought. I want you to think of a stained glass window. So I'll let you get that picture in your head of a stained glass window. And I want you to walk up to that window and press your nose against it. You may be able to see a shard of glass, one color or another. 
and you say, ah, this is a stained glass window. But you may not get what it, what it shows, what it depicts. So you take a step back and you see multiple colors and multiple shapes starting to take place. And you take another step back and you start to see a wing or a cross or a person. And finally you take enough steps back to see the whole thing, the whole picture. Peter knew. Peter was standing this close to Christ. Nose pressed against him and correctly identified him. But he didn't have enough sight to step back and see what Christ was doing. Peter saw the title. Christ wanted him to see the story. Further along in Peter's life, we see great missteps like denying Christ and hearing the cock crow. And there's a time where the Bible is silent about poor Peter. And this leads us to the shores of the sea after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter has gone back to his job as a fisherman. And like any good first century fisherman, he wasn't wearing any clothes. When John turned around to him and said, Hey man, the Lord is over there. Knowing the boat was about 50 yards away from the shore, he puts on a cloak and swims to Jesus instead of waiting for the boat to go 50 measly yards. And there he was, Jesus in the flesh, right there, ready to forgive. And the call is the same. Follow me. Peter's faith shows that whether we are sinking, doubting, fearing, or anxious, or downright ignorant, Christ is right there, ready to forgive, and ready for your rescue. So how did Peter do after this forgiveness? Without his buddy and mentor Jesus beside him, well, the second chapter of Acts tells us he excelled with flying colors. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and spoke in tongues, and all people spoke in tongues, and tongues were understood. The Holy Spirit now reigned in the hearts of the people and no longer the center of the temple. Some thought this was nonsense, and others thought that tailgating started way too early. But Peter... We expect Peter to say, oh, these people are drunk. But no, it is Peter who correctly identifies this is the coming of the Holy Spirit and he stands and he proclaims the coming of the Holy Spirit as from the book of Joel. Peter is excelling. His life is depicted by Scripture as the one that shows maturation and development. It's not only Peter the man, but Peter's faith has grown now in a way where he can truly be the foundation of the church as Christ as its cornerstone. Christ, while on earth, was constantly working on Peter, and Peter was willing to learn, speak up, and grow. He learned not only who Christ was, but also his mission. He spoke up when the time was right to correctly identify Christ in the Holy Spirit. Peter is not the same person when Jesus called out to him on the boat. He grew from Peter the fisherman to Peter the fisher of men. And the call of Christ is still the same. My favorite SNL skit of all time is um, the CEO, this high-powered CEO. He's very smart, but he has the body of a baby. And so he can't walk, so he crawls. And he puts fingers in his mouth. And he, he's wearing a suit, but he's acting like a child. He was a CEO, but still not getting it. Still not uh, with motor skills or function. The same can be said about our faith. As ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we cannot have the same faith as we had when we first accepted Christ. I might be wearing a vest and a tie and talking with some articulation, but if I had the same faith I had when I was 12, then I'd be like a baby in grown-up clothing. Babies are always cute because they have zero motor function. But as they get older, we expect them to be articulate and to walk and to grab and to read and finally to critically think. We as ministers are going to be watched. Our faith is going to be on display for all to see fairly or unfairly. What Peter teaches us is not perfection at every step of the way, but gradual and continual growth encapsulated inside of the grace of Jesus Christ. May we always be aware that our lives, not only being a living sacrifice to God, but also a living witness to the miraculous work and the saving power of our Lord, Jesus Christ.
Amen.